All right. This is so damn exciting. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the DSD. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Sarah Whiting. I'm the dean. Um, this is a really momentous event. It's the first in-person one we've had since March 3rd, 2020. Unbelievable. So that was when, to borrow and butcher the writer Colin McCann's book title, The Great World Spun. We have, since that moment, spun out far and to remarkably remote re realms. But tonight, we all recognize that while that expansion has brought us much good, including streaming attendance, which enables us to reach far corners of the globe, it still really makes a difference to be together. Three dimensions never looked so good. So let me begin by acknowledging that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future, and we honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that led to the creation of this acknowledgement. Thank you. One more thing before we jump into today's event, a quick reminder that we do have live captioning available tonight for our virtual audience. So the audience for this is really big. It's not just all of you. And so to enable captions, please click the close captioning button at the bottom of your live screen window. I also want to thank our events team, especially Paige Johnson, Matt Smith, and Kat Chavez. So we are honored to have the Secretary of Housing, Marsha Fudge, join us tonight. I want to thank her for the time that she's given our students this afternoon and that she's giving all of us this evening. While it's a celebratory moment to come together in person, we're doing so this evening around a sobering topic. Every one of us in this room is acutely aware of the cost of housing in the Boston, Cambridge area. Much of the country, much of the world, in fact, is experiencing a crisis of housing access and housing affordability. But housing is also an opportunity as Michael Kimmelman wrote about in the South Bronx in last Friday's New York Times, and I hope we'll hear more about opportunities this evening. Housing unites all three of the GSD's departments, architecture, landscape, and urban planning and design. It's the intersection of policy and design, of buildings and the land, of individuals and collectives. It's where and how we live as a people. Housing also unites us with the Kennedy School, and we're honored today to be graced by the presence of Doug Elmendorf, the Dean of the Kennedy School. Thank you, Doug. Uh, it's our Joint Center for Housing Studies is the hinge between our two schools. Dr. Chris Herbert is the Managing Director of Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies. He's also a faculty member in the GSD's Department of Urban Planning and Design where he's currently teaching the course, U.S. Housing Markets, Problems, and Policies. It's my pleasure to invite Chris to the lectern to give uh, some background on the Dunlop Lecture Series and to introduce Secretary Fudge. Thank you, Chris. Well, hello. This is really a momentous occasion. I, I, on behalf of the Joint Center for Housing Studies, it's my privilege to welcome you to the 21st John T. Dunlop Lecture and our first live event in two years. Um, I almost wish we could turn the lights up so I could see you all. Um, each year, the Dunlop Lecture provides <laughs> there. Give yourself a round of applause. Each year, the Dunlop Lecture provides us with an opportunity to remember and to honor Professor Dunlop for his many important contributions to the world of academia, policy, and industry, including his critical role in building the foundation for the Joint Center's long history here at Harvard. 
John began his career in the economics department in 1938 and remained actively engaged in teaching and research over the span of second de seven decades until he passed in the early 2000s. Over the course of his many years at Harvard, he served as the chair of the economics department, the dean of the faculty of arts and sciences, and was Lamont University professor. In the public sphere, he served in advisory roles on labor management relations to every president from FDR to Bill Clinton and was labor secretary under President Ford. But among his many important legacies in his decades of public and private service, Professor Dunlop was a staunch ally at a number of important junc junctures in the Joint Center's history, ensuring that the center remains strong and secure intellectually and financially. John recognized the importance of having a center at Harvard that keeps a consistent focus on housing, given its fundamental role in determining the well-being of families and individuals as a critical element of healthy and vital communities and as an important source of good paying jobs and economic activity. And he also saw the value of having a center with a multidisciplinary focus on this complex issue, drawing on diverse academic disciplines and making strong ties with the world of policy and with industry. Simply stated, it's no small part because of Professor Dunlop's vision and support that the Joint Center is still, seven decades later, pursuing our mission of advancing understanding of housing, informing policy, industry, and advocacy, and hopefully training and inspiring the next generation of housing leaders. This lecture was initiated by my predecessor, Nick Ritzinas, as a small but important way of marking our gratitude to John and remembering all he did for the university, for the country, and for our center. So we're pleased to remember and to honor John Dunlop tonight. Over its history, the lecture has featured a variety of perspectives on critical housing issues, offering a platform for distinguished leaders from the worlds of home building, finance, advocacy, and design. One particularly important sector has been policy leaders. Through the years, past lectures have featured mayors, senators, and several HUD secretaries. So tonight, we are pleased to continue that tradition with the Honorable Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge, to deliver this year's lecture, Building the World We Want to See, What Do We Want Our Legacy to Be? Secretary Fudge is the 18th Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, but this role is but the latest in a long and distinguished career in public service where she has continuously worked to help low-income families, seniors, and communities across the country. Secretary Fudge most recently served as the U.S. Representative for the 11th Congressional District of Ohio, where she was a member of several congressional caucuses and past chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. In 1999, Secretary Fudge was elected the first female and first African-American mayor of Warrensville Heights, Ohio, a position she held for two terms. Her roots as a mayor make her no stranger to housing challenges as she adopted one of the first vacant and abandoned property ordinances in the state, worked with local officials to develop a task force to protect against predatory lending, and secured the inclusion of property maintenance grants in the Warrensville <coughs> Revitalization Action Plan. So given her time as mayor, it's perhaps not surprising that Secretary Fudge believes that our housing issues do not fit into a one-size-fits-all approach but rather there'll be policies and programs that can adapt to meet a community's unique housing challenges. When asked in a recent interview by Jonathan Reckford of Habitat for Humanity, who himself was a Dunlop lecturer, what would it take to address our nation's housing challenges? She had a clear, succinct response. Five words, the will to do it. We have the ability, now we just have to have the will. It's encouraging to have such a talented, motivated, and strong-willed leader at HUD to help us find the will we need as a nation to tackle these serious challenges. Following Secretary Fudge's lecture, Gerald Caden, the Frank Backus Williams Professor of Urban Planning and Design, will join the Secretary in a discussion of the themes of her talk and the challenges she faces as HUD Secretary. But now, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you the Honorable uh, Marsha Fudge to deliver this year's Dunlop Lecture. Thank you very much. I need to come back again. <laughs> Sounds so good to see this many people. Thank you all so much for being here. It's my sincere honor and privilege to be with you today. I want to thank uh, Professor Herbert and uh, Dean Whiting, Dean Elmendorf, who I met in my days in Congress, Mayor Siddiqui, 
We have a former HUD regional administrator here, Barbara Fields, and my good friend, Steve Benjamin, who I believe is teaching a course here, the former mayor of Columbia, South Carolina. I'm gonna start our conversation today by posing a series of questions. I wanna ask you about our obligations as people, as citizens, as neighbors. Do we have any obligations as members of our society, whether it be to our environment? Do we owe anyone anything? As children and grandchildren, parents, grandparents, siblings, partners, friends, and neighbors, do we want to be sure that seniors can age with dignity and that children can live in safe and healthy environments? Are we responsible at all for the world that we leave? Are we our brothers and our sisters keeper? Do we have a moral or ethical responsibility to do for others? HUD's mission is important for those very questions that I ask you. Today, America, as you know, faces a crisis in housing. 580,000 Americans sleep on the streets of this country every night. It is a travesty that the greatest nation in the world has people sleeping on the streets. 18 million Americans spend more than half of their resources on rent or mortgage. And the home ownership gap in this country between white and black is wider today than it was in 1968 when the Federal Housing Act was passed. Home ownership rates for baby boomers, like me, those 58 to 75, is at about 78%. For Gen Xers, 42 to 57 years of age, it's about 69%. But for millennials, 26 to 41, it is 48%. And not increasing, but decreasing. And we did not arrive at this crisis by accident. Between 1964 and 2018, hourly pay for the average American worker remained largely flat when you adjust for inflation. And after the Fair Housing Act was finally passed in 68, federal housing investments declined sharply for the next five decades. In 1968, HUD funding accounted for roughly 7% of the total federal budget. Today it's 1%. We stopped caring. We stopped trying. We stopped building low income and affordable income housing. We need millions of homes today to take the pressure off this market so that people can afford to live in a decent home. HUD staffing numbers have dropped as well. In 1977, we had about 18,000 full-time employees. Today, it's less than 8,000. And we all know that a budget is a clear indication of what you think is important. We need to commit the resources to assist builders and developers and mayors and governors to take the stress off the market. We need to upgrade public housing so that people can live in a decent place. We need to help with zoning so that we can build the kind of housing that our future requires. We need to look at lot sizes. How much grass do you need? Really? It's just some more to cut. What else do you need? <laughs> we need to look at the numbers of units and building. Look at the building materials. At HUD, our mission is to ensure that every person in America can enjoy a safe, stable, and decent place to call home. We have a lot of work to do in order to help right the wrongs that this nation's, of this nation's past. Let's talk about how we got here. Did you know that for decades, our government banks and other financial institutions systematically denied most communities of color access to capital and credit. It's called redlining, where they literally would take a red pin and circle an area of the country that was predominantly people of color and decide not to lend money. It's redlining. They deemed those communities ineligible for loans and trust that it still goes on today. There are still communities in this country that have not been afforded the kind of investments they should be 
and all of us know what those communities look like. After World War II, our government subsidized the development of suburbs. Probably most of the people in here at some point know somebody that lived in a suburb. But what they did was they said that you could only get a home in that suburb if you only sold to white families. And they gave you deeds that prohibited you from reselling to a black family. Now this is so close to the time of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Uh, fair Housing, the Fair Housing Act was put in place to stop this kind of activity, but it really didn't. People of color and poor people have lost billions and billions of dollars because they couldn't buy homes. And let me give you a perfect example. There's a town, Leviton, uh, Levittown, Long Island, where homes in the, in the late 40s, early 50s, sold for around $100,000. Those homes today sell for about $400,000. So they lost $300,000 in equity appreciation because they couldn't afford to go in at the time that the market was at its lowest. We've lost billions of dollars. We have built a nation on free slave labor, free prison labor, a direct outgrowth of slavery, and free military labor. But there's never been a discussion about equity or fundamental fairness or justice. So let's talk a bit about what your future will look like. What will housing look like as we move forward? For many people of your generation, and I'm talking to the students now, young people like me. So for many folks in your generation, the house you own and live in will look very different from the house that your grandparents and your parents lived in. The places that you visited as a child and you thought were so comfortable. So let me share a few kind of out of the box solutions that we have been kicking around and have been, are being discussed in the housing community. We're looking at a traditional housing process where you can normally you see they dig a hole, you have a site, they construct a house on, on that property. Those days are really not going to be around much, much longer. As we start to talk about how we build housing, things like factory built housing, where you just build most of the pieces of the house in a factory, you reduce the cost because you're doing it to scale, you take it and you just sit it there and you just put it together like a puzzle. This is A wall connected to B, connected to C. It saves about 20% of the cost of a house but it also cuts out hundreds of jobs. So what are the trade-offs that we have to consider? You know, we have, we're getting more and more people, we're not making a whole lot more jobs because in this country we don't make many things. And until we start to make things again, we, would, we, we won't have problems like the supply chain. We don't make anything, really. You know, we, we, we can't make semiconductor chips because they're made someplace else. We can't make plastic. We can't get things moved the way they should be because we don't make anything. But if we made that plastic and if we made those nuts and bolts and if we made the things that we need in the housing supply, we probably would not be in the place that we are in today. And as technology improves, it is going to be harder and harder to keep people in the workforce. Now we have manufactured homes, which I think are great options for many communities, especially communities in Indian country where the infrastructure is very, very poor. I don't know if you know, but we still have people in this country who live in places where they have no plumbing, who live 10 people to a house where there are so few jobs that the unemployment rate in some of these uh, reservations in particular is as high as 60%, that's six zero, 60%. Do we have an obligation to do something about that? We have modular homes, which are a little different, of course. Uh, and then now we, the big thing is this 3D printed housing. So these houses are built by robots and they're built by cement, out of cement. Now cement, is not the kind of material we want to be using if we're talking about climate change and how we reduce our carbon footprint. But that's what we're doing. So we've got these robots out here just building these houses. We don't know whether they can sustain a bad storm or we don't have any idea. 
But once again, we are putting people out of work. We're also building in places that are not the most desirable places because so many people believe that we should not build in their backyard. They want to keep their two acre lots. They only want a single family house next to theirs. They don't even want you to build these, these uh, small units where people can put their parents or their children. And so we have a major problem in this country. We need to ensure that whatever we build is going to be able to sustain the storms and the floods. And guess who is most affected by those things? They are poor people and people of color. Poor people and people of color tend to be the people who live in flood zones, who live near industrial sites and brownfields. The people who we need to help the most are the people we help the least. So these accessory dwelling units are small, some people call them tiny houses. They can be built on the same property as, as a house you already have. But a lot of people don't even want that. So at, one, at some point we have to understand and ask ourselves a question. What kind of nation do we want to live in? And is housing something that we believe that everybody should have? In San Francisco, I was visiting the, the, the median home price, sales price, is over a million dollars. In Seattle, Washington, over a million dollars. In Denver, 700,000. In Boulder, 800,000. And I could go on and on. And then we wonder why people are sleeping on the street. We wonder why people are saying they can't get workers. I hear that all the time. Let me just say this to you. If, you, if it costs me $800,000 to live in your community and you have no public transportation, I can't get to work. I can't get there. So it just makes sense to me that we would look at how we develop communities and cities, how we make sure that people can be on transportation routes, that we put resources into transportation because that's the only thing that makes it work. We have to also realize that at some point, we need to determine if this is going to be one America or two. One black, one white, one rich, one poor. It is up to us to make the difference. I know that we sit and we say, you know, what can we really do? There's an awful lot that you can do. You come from an environment where some of the brightest minds have been, the greatest thinkers. You're designers. What do you design? What is the blueprint for the future? What do you see? when you look at how you are going to live. Because as I look at all of these young faces, it's not gonna be very long before you're gonna be starting to look at what your housing needs are. Right on this campus today, there are young people who are hungry every day. Right on this campus, there are people who can't figure out where they're going tomorrow. We have an obligation as people to be sure that we do help each other. Now, most people in this country will not attend college. They won't have the same opportunities. They won't have the same kinds of uh, thought leaders and thinkers around them. But we as a nation have to find a way to make sure that their zip code does not determine their life forever. And that's what happens today. Your zip code, determines your life expectancy. It determines whether you're going to end up in prison, whether you are going to get past high school, just because of your zip code. So we need to, as a nation, start to ask ourselves again the question, what do we owe our neighbors? What do we owe our children? Do we owe them removing lead paint from the old houses they live in? In the county I live in, from Cuyahoga County, Ohio, where Cleveland is, 1,000 children are totally disabled because of lead every year, every year. So what do we do? I don't really know what the answer is. That's why I came to Harvard. 
I really don't know what the answer is, but I do believe that Charles Dickens may have been right when he said that it is a tale of two cities. Um, it is the best of times and the worst of times. We have people in this country who are doing extremely well. And I, I'm happy for them. I mean, I think that if you work hard, you should be rewarded. But I also think that you should help those who need your help. I pay more taxes probably than most rich people because they have all of these people, they didn't have all these write-offs. And I don't mind paying them. It is my responsibility to do it. And so I'm actually going to close and start to ask you to engage with me. I think I'm at my time. I've try I'm pretty timely, so I try to stay on schedule. <laughs> but I'm gonna leave you with words that I know that you have heard more than once. But I want you to know that I'm very excited about this opportunity. Um, many of the things I've discussed will give you the kind of problems that you're going to have to face as you go forward. You know, my watch is only so long. I very much am proud of the work I do. I care a great deal about the people I serve. It is my life's work. I know all of you aren't going to be in that same position, but I would suggest to you that at some point in your life, you take the time to do something for somebody who is less fortunate than you. That is who we are as a nation, or at least that is what we should be. So I'm going to close with these words from one of my favorite authors, Robert Fulgham. And I know everybody knows what I'm going to be talking about. It says, all I really need to know I learned in kindergarten. He said, clean up your own mess. And we have made a mess of housing policy in this country. So clean it up. We have to find a way. We have to find the will to do it. We know how. We just don't do it. Don't take things that are not yours. Gentrification is a major problem in this country, and we need to stop it. We cannot continue to build our wealth on the backs of those who have none. Wonder. Take the time to wonder what you can do. Let's look at not what the country is, but what it ought to be. So let's wonder. And lastly, just look. See all of the poverty around you. See the people who need your help. We pass by encampments and things all the time, and we ignore them. See the people. See the need. And with that, I would say to all of you here at this great institution, be a real citizen of this nation. Care about other people. Because if you don't do it, I don't know who will. You are the people who will be running this nation. Not the people that I'm talking about need your help. You will be the ones. So stand in your rightful place and do what is right. And do what is ultimately going to make you feel like the citizen we all ought to be. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Now I follow directions really well. <laughs> So are we, I guess we're on. Wow. Uh, wow. That was a wonderful talk. It was a talk, Secretary Fudge, with a moral. And that's the sort of talk that we need. And I will tell you that tomorrow morning, I'm going to be standing a little deeper in this room, speaking to about 130 students. And your words will be reverberating in Piper Auditorium in their ears and my ears. So thank you for that thank you. wonderful talk.
So it's great to see all of you here, including my students. And by the way, yes, the exercises still do tomorrow <laughs> evening, even though you are here. It's a real estate financial analysis exercise, by the way. Ungraded, but they have to turn it in. So, so here we are, and what we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation for a, a brief while and then open it up to all of you. Uh, we're planning to end at 8 o'clock, we've been told. So that's the, the program. Uh, think about your questions that you may want to ask as we have a conversation, deepening a bit on your uh, wonderful talk. So it's been over a half a century since the enactment of the Fair Housing Act, as you uh, mentioned. And our country is still struggling, let alone affirmatively furthering <laughs> fair housing. Our history with regard to local zoning and other laws and actions that have either intentionally or effectively discriminated on the basis of race is dreadful. And one could argue that it's finally being addressed with regard to, for example, efforts to uh, eliminate single family zoning. So I want to ask you, are you optimistic at this particular moment that those local changes that could result in the reduction, if not elimination, of exclusionary zoning really are going to take root? And I'll add one other thing. You represented, when you were in the House, uh, Euclid, Ohio. And for many people, perhaps in this audience, they know that case, some people would argue, was the original sin of single family zoning by upholding the basic constitutionality of zoning and referring to multifamily housing zoned in separate districts from single family housing as a mere parasite were it to invade the single family district. Uh, as it relates to, um, am I hopeful? You know, I'm always hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I wasn't hopeful, I couldn't do what I do. You just have to always believe that people are going to do the right thing. Not that I'm not disappointed often, but you always have to believe <laughs> that people are going to do the right thing. So yes, I'm hopeful. Um, and I'm hopeful too because right now, because of, and I don't know that you all keep up with all of the things that are happening in Congress. If you're smart, you don't. But we have passed three major pieces of legislation over the last year. So cities are flush with money. They have the resources to make a difference. If they don't, it's because they choose not. The resources are there. And the one thing I know is that as much as we all want to do our part, government is a big player in this. We're all in to try to make it happen. Uh, but yes, I am hopeful. I mean, do you think that the federal government, the national government, has the ability to actually get local communities, which treasure their independence, even from the states they treasure their independence, uh, that the federal government really is going to be able to affect that kind of change in reducing, if not eliminating, exclusionary zoning. Well, I do believe that there are communities who will. Now, I talk to mayors and governors literally every day about these very issues. Uh, there are some who don't see a need to change. But as their own residents start to talk to them about what it costs to live in their communities, I mean, I don't care where you are. There is no place in this country today where you can even rent a two-bedroom apartment on minimum wage. Nowhere. There is no place where you can buy a home if you make minimum wage. And so every city is seeing the same problems. And at some point, if they're going to be good leaders of their communities, they have to start to try to find a way to address it. When you look at the cost of housing today, I couldn't afford to buy a house. I mean, I'm a government employee. I don't make a lot of money anyway. But, but I really, I, I couldn't. So think about the people who have not been given the benefit of the same education, the same experience, the same jobs. So every single mayor is going to have to see that there is a problem. And I can't see that the, all of them are going to ignore it. They have to address it. We're at, a, we're at a tipping point now. So let me ask you, uh, with regard to housing in particular, um, and this issue of ownership versus rental, because you've talked about 800,000, you've also talked about how much it costs to rent. 
And we know that a significant wealth generation opportunity is presented, of course, by home ownership. Um, and of course, that's been one of the issues re with regard to uh, discrimination on the basis of, of race and who was able to own and who was not. Now, over the past 15 years or so, there have been a lot of debates about what's the proper balance between you know, encouraging ownership on the one hand and encouraging renting on the other. And some people have argued that the national government for a while went too far in encouraging home ownership rather than renting. Do you have a, a thought about that? Well, I haven't thought about it because I really do believe that we are all the sum of our experiences. And when you grow up like I grew up, the only wealth you could amass at that time was to buy a home. So if you care about building wealth and you are a poor or moderate income person, you should buy a home if you can. If you don't care about wealth, then rent. See, to me, rent is a waste. But to friends I have, that's the only way they want to live. They don't want the responsibilities. They don't want to take care of anything. They just want to live. And that's great. But I think that we make a mistake if we say to young people, it is not something you should consider doing. I, I would say to young people, buy a house as soon as you can. Even if you don't live in it, buy it. There's only so much land. There's only so much we can do. So own something that will, over the years, maybe it won't be what you want it to be for you, but you can take care of your children and grandchildren. There are not a lot of ways to create wealth in this country. Home ownership is one of them. Right. So two of the major programs to support affordable housing for lower income families are both rental programs. Yeah. Uh, Section 8, which now is simply a housing voucher program on the one hand, yeah. and the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, or right. known as LIHTC to, to many or to practitioners. So they're both rental programs. It's not that there is nothing to support home ownership. In fact, we know the largest national program of the US government indeed supports home ownership. It's the mortgage interest right. tax deduction, which is right. almost, some would argue, criminal in terms of how much money is actually spent with regard to helping uh, people who are in lower incomes. Should there be more programs, in short, from HUD uh, that would support home ownership, as you were suggesting, as a goal? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> We have, over the last year, put in place a number of programs that we think are going to encourage home ownership. The first is we have found that young people, and people of color in particular, the biggest impediment they have to buying a home is student debt. So we have basically found a way to recalculate student debt almost to the point that it is neutralized. So that it's not going to be held against people who want to buy homes. That's number one. Number two, uh, the other big uh, problem that people have is they can pay their rents, but they don't have the down payment. We have down payment assistance. And we're asking for that right now as we go through this budget process. So you have down payment assistance. We have educational opportunities to teach people what they need to do. And lastly, one of the things we're looking at, people who live, who rent as a general rule, or live in public housing, they have no credit, basically. So our thing is, why not make their monthly payments a part of their credit history. So they can show that over time, <laughs> so they can show that over time that they are responsible. But any time that you basically say to people, if you don't have a 20% down payment, we're going to make buying a home difficult for you. It's horrible. I don't know why we do it. I don't know why we ever did it, other than to support banks. I mean, I can't think of any other reason. <laughs> My bank friends, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Uh, by the way, this talk is being recorded uh, and live streamed and, you know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but I think that we have to look at what it takes to get people in housing. And so we need to find ways to reduce down payment. I mean, not to a point where obviously uh, it is going to be we're going to just say to people, come in, and, and then those are the people that walk away from their homes. We want them to have equity. We want them to be responsible. But we also want to do our part to make sure that we encourage people to look at home ownership as opposed to saying, I'm never going to be able to buy a home because I don't have any credit, or I made a mistake somewhere, or my student loan debt. I don't know what it costs to go to Harvard, but I know it's a lot of money. And so when you come out with that kind of debt, it is difficult. Even for those who get really good jobs, it is difficult. 
So we are in a school of design, and it houses a variety of fields, uh, architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, urban design, design engineering. One of the things that unites us, perhaps the key thing that unites us, is our focus on place. This place, rather that place. The built environment here, not there. And of course, over many decades, there's been this great debate. I don't like binaries and dichotomies. I think they oversimplify, but I'm going to do it. People versus place. So should we give housing vouchers to individuals who can then take them and go into communities and it'll pay the difference between you know, their family income you know, and 30% 30, 30 of their family income and, and the fair market rent for that area. To be sure, there, are, there have been problems demonstrated with that kind of program. You can't actually just go anywhere again. Discrimination rears its ugly head, et cetera. But in the old days, no longer with, for example, the Section 8 program and other programs, they were placed-based subsidies. There was a new construction provision of Section 8, a substantial rehabilitation, which gave to actual developers to build development here, not there. What's, what's your thought these days on the so-called people versus place debate? I think that we have to think about it in, 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 um, in very real terms because there's so many things that affect that decision. Zoning is one of them. Yeah. Um, what we do in terms of, if you talked about low income housing tax credits, you've talked about a lot of other things. But ultimately what it's going to take is for communities to agree that they want to give people an opportunity to live in places of opportunity. That they want to give people a choice as to where they raise their children. And I don't know that we're there right now. I don't know that we're there. Uh, but I think it's, it's, the concept makes sense to me. I mean, I think it's great. But I just don't know if it's reality right now. I just, I just I'm not sure where we are. Right. Um, many of the programs that HUD administers rely on a public-private partnership model. Um, in which private developers and investors are encouraged through the profit motive to advance public interest goals that are articulated by the national government, or the Congress, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, et cetera. Some people think it's gone way too far, and it's actually a, a program that enriches uh, wealthy developers. Other people think it's a great model. Um, we're not going to have the national government build all of the public housing or social housing or housing for uh, families uh, with needs. W where do you come down on this? Do you have a sense that it's, it's too much, it's too little, it's about right? I think anybody that thinks it's too much really probably isn't really looking at the numbers, at least not honestly. The federal government can only do so much. We need the private sector to do most of the building. We don't build houses. We help people build them. And so, is we are actually right now looking to raise the cap on LIHTC and put another $10 billion in it. Because until we do that, we are not going to convince them to build low income and moderate housing, moderate housing, because they don't make money. So you have to create an incentive of some sort to make it workable. And if you don't, we're going to be always where we are now. We're not going to invest in, in housing. And, and, and our disinvestment over the last 20 years is why we are where we are today. It's not a surprise. It's, it's just what we did and didn't do. So if we don't give them the incentive, the problem is going to get worse. Now, you may want to have a, a conversation about it, you know, I mean, and, but it is what it is. So if we don't provide the incentive, I just don't think that we can start to even put a dent in the problem. Let me, I mean, I know you don't really know much about politics. You know. No. <laughs> Um, does it help politically to get programs through if, for example, the private business community in real estate is supporting a program? Does no that... question about it. I mean, they're asking for more. Yeah. Because they're having problems just like everybody else. They deal with the same zoning that we deal with. They deal with the same cost of materials we deal with. They deal with the same supply chain we deal with. And so they are looking for help because a lot of them are struggling as well. So yeah, of course, we want to have the home builders on our side. We want to have um, 
Home Depot, we want to have Lowe's, whoever's going to help us, we want them. Right. I mean, the reality has been that there have been coalitions of business sure. groups and low-income housing groups who all want the same thing. That's right. Let us build housing. Let's That's right. increase supply. That makes, obviously, you know, an enormous amount of, of sense. So I did want to address, and you touched uh, on this in your talk, but uh, a little more deeply, uh, the national government's role in addressing the crisis of homeless individuals in terms of both housing and services. What, what do you see, for example, as HUD's role in particular? I think it's probably to convince uh, the people who really have, hold the purse strings that it's important. I'm not going to say as frankly as I normally say about what I think about some of my former colleagues. Um, but I do believe that some of them are not living in the real world. If you can, in good conscience, say that it's okay for 200,000 veterans, people who have served this country to sleep on the street, there is something wrong. If you are not willing to say, yes, we need to really tackle this in a way that is going to put some impact, some real dent in homelessness, something has got to be wrong with you. We can't continue to live in a nation where the people who need the government most can't get government help. Now, there are a lot of people who believe that small government is the way we should go. But the smaller the government gets, the more people who are hurting. And at some point, we're going to have to take care of them somewhere. I don't care if it's an emergency room, if it's in a, in a, in a prison cell, if it's on the street. It costs us more money to not help them than it does to help them. So why would you fight the whole concept of helping people in need. But, but they hold the purse strings. We can just do what we can do with, with, the, with the resources we get. So my job is to talk to my colleagues, to convince them that this is something that is worthy for them to put in the budget, to give us the opportunity. Now, I will say, at the end of 20, they did pass in the COVID package, they put $10 billion for homelessness. $5 billion to get vouchers out, to get them into housing. But the problem is you can have as many vouchers as you want. If there's no place for them to go, they're still on the street. And then $5 billion for communities to do things like um, either build new housing. Um, people are buying hotels. They're buying commercial buildings. And they're turning them into a permanent housing for the homeless. But it's 580,000 people. That only goes so far. So we just have to make a decision if, if, if it's really what we want to do as a nation. And if we choose to do it, we will. We find money to do anything we really want to do. And half of it, I would disagree with. So this depends. So thus far, we've really focused on housing. And uh, the reality is that your department is called the Department of Housing and urban development. Um, I don't know if this is an apocryphal story. I, I don't think it is. I, I've looked it up, and there's some evidence for this. Apparently, when the department was initially proposed back in the early 60s, uh, it was going to be called the Department of Urban Development until people realized what that acronym stood for. Um, dud. I thought I'd get a larger laugh than that. OK. So, Maybe people threw in housing so it wouldn't be dead, but I don't think so. But I'm, I've always been struck, and something you said about you know, $800,000 houses and public transportation, I've always wondered whether or not, first of all, urban development has been given the richness in the department, and also whether if you were able to just reconfigure public agencies at the national level, would it be called the Department of Housing transportation and urban development, putting aside what Secretary Buttigieg might think about that. But you know, do we have the right combination there? And urban development certainly encompasses housing, but a lot of other things. I wonder if you might uh, tell us about what that all means. No, I think that it probably is right, because you know, Mayor Benjamin said out there, we are the voice of, of cities. We're the people who give out community development block grant money. We are the people who have home money. We are the people who um, make sure that housing trust money is out. So we help cities. We give technical assistance to cities. We help cities set up programs. So I think that they really do mesh pretty well. Because as you look at our governmental structure, 
mayors and cities have much more to do with housing than any other entity at any other level of government. So why not keep the two together? Because we really do advocate for cities. Sure. Housing and non-housing. Right. Now, what about, though, transportation? Is it simply good enough to deal with a, uh, you know, a brethren agency at the cabinet level and work together, as, of course, you do with other agencies? Well, I would say that, you know, well, Pete and I, I mean, uh, Secretary Buttigieg and I <laughs> work together. You can call him Pete. Uh, quite we well. We can't, but you uh, can. <laughs> but I will admit, the federal government has too long done everything in silos, including transportation. But until we start to talk about building with transportation in mind, then we have made a, a, a tremendous mistake. So I think that we do have to work very close together, and we do. I don't know what's going to come after us, but right now, we're doing it. We're working together. All right, so let me ask one final question, and then we turn it over to this very excited and educated uh, audience. So what's more fun? to be mayor, to be a member of the House of Representatives, or to be the HUD secretary? And you can also choose what period of time you're talking about. <laughs> you know, I have been thinking about that, and I think it's smart to not answer that question. <laughs> so it may be smart to not answer, but I'm going to ask you again. And of course, <laughs> if you actually don't answer, I'll ask okay. it again. Okay. okay, then I'll answer. Okay. Um, the most fun. That's what I asked. Mayor. And I say mayor because you're closest to the people. You know, I mean, if I was out in my yard, my neighbors would just walk up and start to talk to me. If I went to the grocery store, I mean, you were close to the people, and the people believe you can change their lives. So there's a lot of confidence put in mayors, especially of smaller communities like mine. And people believe in you. It's harder the further away from the people you get. So when I was in Congress, yeah, it was kind of the same, but I had 700,000 people instead of the people I had when I was mayor. And now we have a whole nation. And so you get further and further away. So that's why I'd say mayor. OK, well, um, as I said, that was the last Don't uh, question. Don't tell the president I didn't say I said the mayor. Listen. <laughs> You know, yes, we told you this was all secret, but then I revealed and we live streamed and recorded and all of that. So it's now time for all of you to demonstrate what it means to be uh, at Harvard, whether as a student faculty member or affiliate of any sort. So uh, what is going to happen is there are four people in this room who all have the same first name of Mike and the same last name of Runner. So they're mic runners. That's <laughs> what I was told. So I, maybe it's not their names. So you raise your hand. I will call on you. We also have people that Chris Herbert uh, will be uh, telling us about from afar. And you will raise uh, your hand. So we start that way. And over there, please, two up, mic runner. Thank you. Um, hello, thank you so much for coming to speak with us and especially for the work that you're doing and the really insightful speech that you gave. I was especially struck by your discussion of some of the trade-offs that you have to think about as you craft policy and, and how thoughtfully you're thinking about that. But there was one aspect of the trade-offs that you spoke about that struck me as somewhat illogical, which was in your discussion about how new technology is allowing us to build housing so much more easily and how this, uh, at the same time, reduces the number of jobs. But it strikes me that America is a very work-centered country and that many of us are overworked. And in fact, many of us feel we're working more and more hours for less and less pay. So if we have the technology to provide people with their basic needs, why are we requiring them to work and labor in menial jobs in order to live a basic dignified life, and why don't we just provide them with the things that they need with basic human rights like housing, if we can build them so much more easily now? I don't disagree with you. We don't do it because we just don't do it. We still have people who believe that, I mean, now I'm, I'm a big fan of technology. I think it is something, you know, the more uh, we grow as a nation, I think the economies of scale require 
that we have more technology and more automation. But what I'm suggesting to you is that we have so many people in this country who don't have those same kinds of skills because they've never been given those same kind of opportunities. And so you think about, it, you have to have some kind of science and math proficiency to do almost any job in this country today. But if you go to the schools in our neighborhoods, you don't have it. And so then what do they do? They work with their hands. What do they do? And so at some point we have to decide for ourselves that we're either going to invest in training and teaching our students to do the jobs of the future. Because in the next few years, 80% of every job in this country will, will require some kind of a STEM background. If we're not teaching STEM, then, then how do they get those jobs? And that's the only point that I was making. I, 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 I do believe, look, I'm overworked. <laughs> uh, you know, but a robot can't do my job. <laughs> so, but, but, but neither can the person who lives down the street from my house because they have not been privileged and given the kind of education and background that I have. And so we have to look at all of the people. We can't just discard some. We still have to look at everybody in the country. Um, over there, please, sir. You raised your hand, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Secretary. Um, my name is Derek Thomas. And uh, I probably wouldn't ask this question unless you had specifically mentioned accessory dwelling units in your talk. So obligations and opportunity. Uh, there is a major opportunity in accessory dwelling units. You don't need extra grass for them, as you say. Uh, they're naturally affordable. Uh, they're a perfect example of incremental growth and development. Um, but my major barrier in designing them and building them uh, is zoning and funding. Is HUD working towards or engaging with design builders, architects, planners uh, in supporting accessory dwelling units at a national level? And I guess just to kind of summarize, the city of Boston uh, has a $50,000 loan program to help homeowners build ADUs. And uh, we found that helps bring down a lot of barriers in getting them built. Thank you. We are talking about it. And, and just so that I don't forget, my, my, my deputy chief is sitting right in front of you to just turn around, get her card. <laughs> Don't call me, call her. <laughs> um, but we are doing, I mean, even to the point that, that I have been meeting with our counterparts in Canada and in Japan and in London, we're all trying to figure out, especially when we started to talk about the space of aging in place. That's kind of where we started out. That's where, that was our jumping off point. And then we realized how many other uses it has. But yes, we are all talking about how we do it. But once again, we go back to zoning. Zoning is also still a major issue in that. I mean, I think it's so very simple that we should be able to do it, but we are looking into it. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, right there. No, no, one more back. Yes, you, please. It's, I'm not, you know, I'm just trying to spread it around. I'll Thank you so it. much for being with us, Secretary Fudge. My question is around preservation. You spoke a lot about new builds and LIHTC, and I was wondering with Brookfield and Blackstone and a lot of the big private equity money that's coming in and jacking up prices and making it more difficult for smaller buyers to remain competitive in the market, what role you believe preservation has and if HUD is looking at any potential mechanisms to make the pricing kind of capped at a certain rate so that other buyers can come in and kind of maintain the affordability, which right now you have to be very creative with housing authorities for tax abatements and working with nonprofit borrowers. So just curious as to what your thoughts are there. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so glad you asked it. You know, one thing about it, when I have power, I use it. I don't even think twice about it. And so one of the things that we have done since, uh, since we've come in as you know, and I'll give you a perfect example. We just had a sale at HUD of about 1,700 homes. Before we came in, everyday average people could only have 10 days to figure out what homes were for sale to try to buy. Now they have 30. We sold more than half of them to people who want to live in them. Secondly, what we're doing is starting to give low dollar loans, loans under $100,000, which banks and FHA, which is a part of HUD, would not do. So they didn't make any money on them. So what happened is you could not go into a, a distressed neighborhood, buy a house for $30,000 or $40,000 and fix it up. You can now. 
The other thing we're doing is we are making sure that we're giving rehabilitation loans for these communities and we are making sure that we are keeping flippers out of the market until at least we give primarily now nonprofits the opportunity to come in and purchase those homes and to then give them to people who want to live in them. So we, we know that that was, has been a problem and we're doing all of those things right now that were not being done before. Great. Um, right here, please. Uh, Mike Runner, Mike, you're, thank you. Well, Secretary Fudge, um, I actually am from South Euclid, Ohio, so suburb of Cleveland. Um, <laughs> the question, so this, this past um, winter break, I had the opportunity um, to intern. It's, we have this program at the Kennedy School called Transition Term, and I had the opportunity to work in St. Petersburg, Florida with Mayor Ken Welch um, doing work in affordable housing. And so something that we were seeing, especially that's true to the Tampa Bay region there, um, but other cities across the nation as well, is that the pandemic um, has allowed a lot of people who, to re reconsider what, they, what matters to them. And many people have left cities such as New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles to migrate to cities that ha allow for more space and um, things of that sort. And so they've been able to move from their cities with their lavish luxury um, salaries and are moving to these areas where now they are able to buy houses on the market immediately. Um, and so people who have been in those areas traditionally are no, no longer able to purchase homes. And so the question here is how should cities be thinking about, um, you know, how should cities be thinking about this growth um, and how sh can they protect the citizens that are local to their cities while also being able to economically benefit um, from, the, from, the new, from the new growth? Well, that's what I was talking about when I was talking about gentrification as a major problem in America's cities today. Uh, because what is happening, because there are so few houses, that's the first thing. But the other thing is people forget that um, when a lot of this housing was originally built, it was built for workers. And it was built on the water, or it was built in places that now are places where people want to live. And so when we allow people to come in and buy up neighborhoods, then we, st we need to start to think about, first off, how do we make sure that those properties are maintained? Generally, seniors or generational families have lived in those properties. We need to make sure that we can give them the opportunity to stay there. We have to look at the tax bases because all it takes is for somebody to come in and build a mini mansion and everybody else's taxes go up. So we have to look at how we do taxes. We also have to look at how we um, allow people to purchase large lots, which goes back to zoning again. Because a lot of times, I mean, it's so bad now, people will come in and just raise the house that was there and build a mansion because it's so affordable based upon them coming from a New York or a Seattle and moving to a small town in Florida. But it's all up to the city government. You know, it's not up to us, unfortunately. It is up to the people who represent you at that local level. They have to make those decisions and determine how they want to stop it or why they want to let it proceed. Really, it's up to the mayors. Hey, thanks for coming. Um, so you said um, we cut 20% of the cost of building houses because of efficiency, basically, but we lost uh, jobs because of that. And you said that we need to make more things here again, which you know I'm totally down for. But what incentives specifically, or like what mechanisms can you use specifically to encourage that? And um, like what sector within housing is more human-centric and like less technology based, you can put more resources into that. Well, the first thing when I said we need to start make more things, I mean just manufacture things in, in general, not necessarily in the housing supply chain. Because right now, the biggest things we make in this country are cars, and we still don't, and most of the parts don't even come from here. Um, we make some things that we historically, but we don't, the manufacturing base in this country is pretty much gone. We get more, and, I, and I'm not suggesting we should isolate ourselves as a nation. I'm just saying the things that we need, we need to be able to make here. That will create an environment where there are more jobs. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? 
like I agree with that and I get that, but like what incentives like specifically can like you apply from your um, standpoint in order to like encourage that? Like I know it's like a okay. whole encapsulating thing, but like from your viewpoint specifically. Well, just, just in Ohio, we just got a new semiconductor plant that they're gonna be building right outside of Columbus. The state put in almost $2 billion, $2 billion, because they know that it's going to be hundreds of thousands of jobs. They know what's going to happen. They know the return on it. The government does this all the time. I was talking to the students earlier today, and I was talking about the cost of prescription drugs. Let's just use that as an example. The federal government actually funds most of the research of those drugs. That's an incentive for them to create those kinds of drugs for the people in this country. Now, they, do they sometimes cost much, much more than they should be? Absolutely. But we fund it. We fund most of the research and technology that goes on in this country. The federal government does. So we give incentives on a regular basis. Uh, Chris, you have a question from outside of the I, I do. I just want to re remind people we are now in a hybrid world. So as much as we are excited to be here, there are many, many more people at home watching. So there's a big audience out there. They want to be included in the room as well. So uh, I, I can't possibly go through all the questions I have here. I do want to call out one secretary, which is a, a woman who said, from everything you say, I feel hope. So thank you. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Um, but one question is uh, related to your comments during the speech about gentrification and the fact that you say you know, all we need is the will. So if the federal government had the will, what would a federal policy look like to mitigate the effects of gentrification? Well, again, I think it's, it's kind of... Um, it really is not up to the federal government. It really is up to local communities. I mean, I know that people believe, I mean, we have, we have two trains of thought. Some people believe that the government should be in everything, and some people believe it should be in nothing. But that is really a very local issue. Now, if it were me, if I was the mayor of the city, I would be working with my city council to make sure that we don't allow those kinds of things to happen. And we can easily do it by not giving the permits, by doing a lot of things. But it really is a local issue. And I don't think that the federal government really should be in it. I just don't think it's our place. Thank you, Secretary Hud, for being here. Uh, Fudge for being here. Before I uh, came, sorry. Um, I get tongue tied all the time. <laughs> Before I came to Harvard to study, I was a contractor at HUD and I worked on the customer experience team. And I know that uh, President Biden passed an executive order at the end of last year to help transform the customer experience. You also talked a little bit about how the further you are from the people, the harder that job can be. And so my question for you is, what is your vision for HUD's customer experience? And is there any particular interaction that HUD has with its customers that you hope to improve? Um, while you're in your role. Well, I, you. could, I have asked my staff to allow me to, to allow me, because you knew you had to get permission from your staff, uh, to allow me to talk to tenants every week. Wherever I go, I meet with tenants. I meet with tenants organizations because I want to hear from them. That's, I'm a grassroots person. And so I miss that interaction. But the other thing I think that we have to make sure that we do is make sure that the people who work in our regional offices the people who are really closest to the people. Make sure that they're out there. One of the first things that I talk with them about is we have to stop being a reactive agency. We need to be part of the community. People should know who runs the HUD office. They shouldn't just only find out who we are when they have a problem. We should be at community events. We should be at housing authorities dealing with things. So it is my position that that is a part of our role, not to just sit in our offices until somebody calls us. We need to go out meet people and let them know what we do and how we can help them. So that is happening uh, little by little. We're finally just getting all of our regional administrators hired. I think we got the last ones coming in in the next week or so. So I think the people will see a difference because that's just my philosophy. I just don't believe that you sit back. That's always the rap that government gets. We don't do anything. We work very hard, which you know. We just don't tell people what we do. I mean, earlier today when you met with students, you told a story about visiting the New York City Housing Authority, uh, public housing. And of course, you can't go to every public housing uh, complex in the United States, but how 
I wonder if you could share that story uh, because I think it, it really was a significant one. Um, I, I was telling them that um, I went to New York and I went to one of the public housing buildings. And I went to two units, one, and they were both senior citizens. One, I came into her unit and so she takes me into her bathroom and tells me that she is afraid to use her bathroom because there is a hole in her ceiling and mice come out. I mean, literally, she was scared to death. I mean, she's crying, right? So then she takes me into the kitchen and she says that her sink isn't working. I said, what's wrong with your sink? She says, well, when she puts water down one side, it comes up the other. But the plumber has been there three or four times and they haven't fixed it. And so, of course, I go apoplectic with the people and it gets fixed that week. I shouldn't have had to be the one to make them fix it. They should want people to live in a decent place. We pay them for that. So the next unit I go to, she has no bathroom, no tub, no shower, no floor. She said she had been waiting for months to get it fixed. Hers was fixed that week too, but it shouldn't have taken me to get it fixed. And so if I don't do anything else, I need for everybody who is in our care, and that's whether you have a voucher, whether you live in public housing, to know that we care enough to make sure that everybody should be able to live decent. I was crying. I mean, it could have been my grandmother. It could have been my mother. We cannot let people live in squalor. I don't care how poor they are. We cannot let people live with rats and roaches and mold that looks like wallpaper on their walls. We can't continue to do it, and I won't. Um, there and then there, okay. So you'll be next. Thank you, uh, Secretary Fudge. Uh, my name is Gabe Zerman. I'm a law student here at the Tenant Advocacy Project. Just as an aside, um, I represent tenants in Section 8 units and in public housing. Two weeks ago, we had a big blizzard here, and I went to my client's unit, and there was no heat. And she has five children, including a three-year-old. Um, I gave her a space heater. Um, I don't blame the public housing unit because they were trying their best, but it's just another example of what you were just talking about. Make sure that you give that, the, the, raise your hand. Make sure we know who that is. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, another thing that PHAs in this community are doing, which is eliminating people from Section 8 vouchers and from public housing due to alleged criminal activity. Um, I represented a client um, who has seven children, including a newborn baby, and a PHA in this community um, threatened to evict her because her daughter's ex-boyfriend allegedly had drugs in their unit. I know that you sent a letter to um, all the PHAs saying that this is not okay, that they shouldn't take these things into account, and it is evident that PHAs around the Boston area are either not taking that into account when they make their decisions or aren't, or just, you know, evicting people or threatening to evict people or terminate subsidization for no reason. So um, I'd love your support in, in trying to get some of that changed because I know that you support it and I know that things can sometimes get lost in translation as they're going down to the local level. Thank you. Well, let me say I appreciate it. I mean, we can only fix things if we know about them. So I'm glad that you're raising it. Um, yes, we sent out a letter. We didn't ask them not to do it. We told them not to do it. Mm -hmm. And so um, we'll make sure that we address it. Thank you. And, and for those who don't know PHA's public housing authorities, please. Um, sorry. So my name is Karen Blondell. I'm a Loeb Fellow. Um, without this Loeb Fellowship, I would have never been in college period. Um, I've never been to college, though I've pursued it since 17 years old when I took my first plane to Utah to Job Corps because I thought Job Corps was college, okay? And, you know, I got beat out of a little money from a business school in New York, but I always appreciated education. So I educated myself in New York's public libraries, and that's where I started out, on the computer. And then I got to the Joint Urban Manpower Program. That was a program that was ran by New York State that helped young people vocationally learn how to be construction inspectors. 
And I bring that up because I know there's a lawsuit federally around the inspections going on with HUD. So I would like to propose that we bring that program back. I am a public housing resident to this day. I live in Red Hook, Brooklyn. I'm the newly elected president of Red Hook West. After 30 years or so of the same leadership, so I'm there to really make a change in my community. Um, but I would love to see the Joint Urban Manpower Program get some funding from HUD in New York State and trickle down to New York City, because I know this is being recorded, um, <laughs> because that program really made a difference. It taught me how to be a computer-aided draft and designer, and it also taught me about facade inspections. And what I, the point I'm trying to get at is that if we're going to think about changing zoning without a civil war, then we have to think bigger. We have to think about climate zoning. We have to get people to buy in that they, is, they just can't sit on two acres by themselves while people are living on top of each other in public housing. Now, I'm not going to say public housing is bad because we love where we live in New York City. We want it stabilized, and we want it stabilized without privatization. I helped. Gowanus and Wyckoff houses get $217 million last year as a pilot of the blueprint that Greg Russ is pushing in New York City. I support the blueprint because it keeps public housing public. We, the residents, need to learn skills around mold abatement and um, asbestos removal, not just so that we could fix our buildings in New York, but our neighbors, these millionaires living around us, they're still going to need more work. They're still going to need asbestos work. And so I figure if we train the residents, not only will they be able to help their own self in the buildings that are dilapidated throughout New York City, but they, we can also help our other neighbors in the community. So I want to give you my card. Listen, one of the things we are doing is trying to convince um, our local authorities to hire residents. Because the one thing we know is that they take care of their property better. They know the neighbors. They know the culture. They know the neighborhood. So we are encouraging that, whether it be inspectors or uh, contractors, those people who live within those communities. So we're on the same page with that. Thank you. Let me make sure I don't ignore the steps. Uh, right here, raise it, good. That person there, please. Ah, the challenge of which mic runner goes to the <laughs> person. Yeah, I mean, I have, to, I have to follow that. Gosh, I'm nervous. Um, so what do you believe is the responsibility of the federal government in regulating the short-term rental market insofar as homeowners are, especially in cities with a lot of capital accumulation, um, can see a lot of profit and they're incentivized by renting their units to the travel industry and short-term rentals and um, not to those who are economically precarious. Thank you. Mean you. Like, like, uh, like Airbnb. Oh, okay. We really, don't, we really don't have any authorization over Airbnbs, do we? Okay, I had to ask. Um, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have any, any authorization over, at, at all over those. It's a good thing. So, sorry, just as a follow-up. So, um, are, is, is the responsibility then left up to regional and local governments? It is. So the federal response, the federal, no. none, okay. Yeah, I mean, because it, yeah, it, it strictly is a local issue. Local and re maybe regional, but for sure local. Okay. Uh, all the way back there, and then Chris, you have somebody from outside the room. Yeah, up top, in that case, yes, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for speaking with us. Um, I was wondering, what is your thought and your administration's thinking about the inherent, inherent trade-off between affordability and wealth building? Over the last 50 years, home ownership has been such a powerful wealth builder because of rising home prices. How do you balance this desire to help people who have not owned property to continue accumulating wealth but also to reduce home prices relative to wages um, to sort of balance those two things. I'm not really sure what you're asking me. Ask me again. All right, sorry. Okay, so home ownership has been such a profitable thing for homeowners because right. prices have been going up for the past 50 years and faster than inflation. If we increase supply significantly or otherwise change our policies to reduce prices, then we lose home ownership 
as a mechanism through which people can build wealth. So there's sort of a trade-off in, in, in those two policies. And I'm wondering how you think about that trade-off, uh, you and your administration. Well, Thank you. I don't think that we lose the, the wealth building. It's just not the bubble that we're in now. The pricing is always going to continue to go up. It just won't go up as rapidly. And what we then do as well is we bring people into the market who now have been left out of the market. It's not that they're not going to make money, but we really are in a bubble right now. And so I think that we just, we just have to look at the fact that it won't be rising as rapidly as it is now, but we do bring tons and tons of people into the market who, if we don't do it, will never get in the market. So we have a hard stop at 8 o'clock, so I'm going to call on Chris, who's actually bringing somebody from outside the room inside the room. And we have three minutes, so Chris, you're on. So this is not a big question, Secretary Fudge. Uh, in your remark, you talked about the racial disparities in housing, in the, the history of redlining, the history of discrimination, and the, the way in which that's impacted the communities of color to this day. But from the federal government's point of view, the ability to target people on the basis of race is limited by the Fair Housing Act. What can the federal government do to help to explicitly the BIPOC community to close those gaps from the decades of discrimination? In a few weeks, we're going to have a report coming out. I chair a, a commission that's called PAVE, where we look at how properties are valued in certain communities. The federal government does, in fact, have some control over the appraisal process and how appraisals are done. And so when they come and value my house $25,000 less than the house, then I have an issue. The federal government can address that. It's fair housing is basically what it is. It's discrimination. It's bias. And those are things that we do. We do that. And so you're going to see a report from us in the next few weeks that I think will be very enlightening. So uh, all right, one more. We've got two minutes left. Uh, good evening, uh, Secretary. My name is Bolidar Richardson. I'm born in Chicago, Illinois, USA. Uh, you spoke in terms of generational wealth as it relates to housing. And I'm curious if a discussion was made within your administration in terms of land reparations for blacks in America. And I also want to, excuse me. Yeah, I'm curious if uh, there was a discussion within your administration about land reparations for blacks, and if you think black, blacks should receive funding for America's past history as it relates to slavery, and how does that look for all Americans? Well, I mean, reparations have been discussed in the Congress, I know, for the last 40 years, because John Conyers used to bring a bill to the floor every single Congress about reparations. Another conversation is there, and I would suggest to you this. Until we can determine what we actually mean by reparations, it's going to be an issue. There are some who believe that uh, we do reparations by making our schools and our communities better. There are some who believe it's, it's, re it's actual money. There are some who believe that we go back to the 40 acres and a mule. But reparations come in a number of different formats and in different forms. And so until we can have a conversation about what it should look like, I don't see it going any further than it's already gone. Now, do I believe it's a discussion we should have? Yes. I don't know that we're having that conversation across the administration, and if we are, I'm not involved in the conversation, but it is something we should talk about. What does reparations look like to you? Well, reparations to me, I would probably think more along the lines of how do we uplift communities? How do we make better schools? How do we make safer housing? How do we do the things to make people live in an environment which is, is positive and an environment full of opportunities? So I'm looking at uplifting a whole, not a person, but a community. That's what that looks like to me. So uh, we've come to the end of our time with you. I'm so glad, because I... y'all are wearing me out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad about it. I think, uh, <laughs> wait, 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 we want to. So, so seriously, um, I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, I can't speak for everybody here, let alone everybody outside of here, but I, I think I'm pretty good at reading a room. And wow, you have wowed this room with your intelligence and, and your passion, obviously. And it, it makes us confident about, again, a future. You keep talking about the future here, but you are our present, and at least hopefully for the next 
however many years, uh, our future as Secretary of HUD. So please join me in thanking Secretary Fudge. <laughs>